Let's try a few more examples. A blood bank catalogs the types of blood, including whether it is Rh positive or Rh negative, given by donors during the last five days. The number of donors who gave each type of blood is shown in the table. So before we get started, let's look at this table here. So going down the columns, you have the type of blood. So you have O, A, B, and AB. And then going this way, you have if you are Rh positive or negative. And then you can see that they've done the totals for each of the rows and each of the columns here for us already. So for instance, this number 156 represents the number of people who are blood type O and who are positive, right? Or the 25 here represents the number of people who are blood type A or, excuse me, blood type A and negative. So the 25 people here have blood type A and they're negative, so they're A negative. Okay, so that's what each of those pieces mean in the table. All right, so let's find the probability that a donor selected at random has blood type O or blood type A. So I'm looking for the probability of type O or type A. So let's think about this idea for a second. When we have our blood types, can a person be blood type O and blood type A? Well, no, they can't, right? You're, you're one or the other. So these events here are mutually exclusive. They're not overlapping. Okay, so you can't be in both groups. So because they're not overlapping, then to find our probability, we're just going to add these two up um, individually. So let's go ahead and see what we have here. I'm going to just use pink to help us circle. So the number of people who are blood type O is 184. And the number of people who are this blood type A is 164, because you can see they gave us our totals. So I know. My numerators here are going to be 184 and 164, but I do actually have to find the total first. Um, so before I do that, I have to add everything up here to get my totals. Um, and you can actually see it's done for you in the table. So you can either add these yourself and looking at all the different blood types here, or this 409 is your overall total for the whole group. So it adds correctly in both directions, right? So if I add this way, I get all the people sorted by blood type. And if I add this way, I get all the people sorted by RH positive or negative. So 409, that's how you read it. Where you see that total in both sections, that's your overall total. So I'm gonna divide these both uh, by 409. Just looking at my notes here, I already have it off to the side. So it's gonna be 348 out of 409 altogether. And then when I use my calculator, I get about 0.8. Five, one. So about 85% of people who came in actually were blood type O or A. All right, second question. Find the probability that a donor selected at random has blood type B or is RH negative. And again, there's that keyword or. So I'm looking for the probability of type B or um, RH negative. Now let's use a different color here. So for people who are blood type B, that's this group, right? And then people who are RH negative would be this group. Notice that there's overlap here, right? Whereas before my two columns went down, there was no overlap. Those, so if I kind of want to put too much color here, but if I draw them in, and I circle my two groups, there's no overlap there. Whereas if I circle here, I have overlap. So those eight people here are B and negative. So they do occur in both groups. So this is not mutually exclusive. So to find my formula then, it's gonna be the probability of type B plus the probability of RH negative minus the probability of being type B and RH negative. So how many people are type B? Well, looking at my orange column here, I see 45 people. 
out of 409. How many people are RH negative? So going over, I see that total is 65 out of 409. Now I do have an overlap here of eight. So I'm gonna subtract out the eight out of 409. Okay, and again, the reason I'm subtracting here is because notice what happens. When I count my B group, right, and I get that 45, I have counted the eight people. When I count my negative group, and I've counted the 65, I counted those eight people again. I counted them twice. So I counted them once going down and once going across. So I've double counted. That's why we subtract out one of the eights because we've double counted the eight twice. So I subtract out that overlap region so that I have not double counted anymore. And what we get is 102 over 409, which is about 0.249. Now, another way to deal with events that are not mutually exclusive is to just also be careful with your counting. So if you're not so much a formula person, um, you can still do it even without the formula. You just have to think for a second, right? So if we're looking at B or negative, like we said, if we've already counted the B people, we've counted the eight already. So when you add in the other group, just add in the 28, the 25, and the four so that you don't double count. If you add up those values of 37, 8, 28, 25, and 4, you'll get that same 102. Um, so you can do it more manually as well if that's more how your brain works. Uh, the big thing is the reason why we subtract is because we just don't want to double count. So that's the only thing you want to really be careful of when you're doing these probabilities is making sure you're not counting that same group more than once. Um, so that's where the subtraction comes in. But we could just do it more carefully too as we're adding everything up if you prefer. All right, let's look at one more example here. All right, so up top, and this is from your text, um, it's just a quick summary of the, some of the probability work that we've done so far. Um, so your classical probability, looking at the number of outcomes over the sample space, your empirical probability, looking at the frequency over the total frequency. In both cases here, you're always still looking at part over total. So that idea doesn't change, even though um, we have you know slightly different ways of thinking of it. Your empirical probability tends to be your real world data, whereas your classical probability tends to be from things like rolling die and cards um, and events that, that don't change, the probabilities don't change. When we have probabilities, they're always between zero and one. We've talked about complementary events here. So being able to, um, if you want the complement, we can use that by subtracting with one from the regular event. So remember that the probability of an event occurring plus the probability of the complement of that event occurring is one. So we can use this idea a lot. We've talked about the multiplication rule in the last section, which is your and idea. So you can see those keywords and there. Uh, and we talked about conditional probabilities. And then now we're talking about or, which are typically your addition problems. Um, so when you see ands, you want to think multiplying. When you see ors, we tend to think addition. Um, and that's just kind of a quick summary of the rules. And the big thing here is you just want to be super careful when you read through problems. Um, I make mistakes too if I'm reading too fast. So I may look too fast and think I see the word and, but it was really the word or. Or I missed that we had a conditional probability because they had said that one event had started first or no, was given first, we'll say. Um, so just be really careful as you're reading through those little tiny word changes make all the difference in statistics, particularly with probabilities. So that's something I always warn students about. And that's something that students probably get the most frustrated with in statistics is the wording. So really read carefully, take your time, um, but make sure you understand what the question is asking before you jump in and find that probability. Look for those little keywords, uh, look for ordering and so on. All right, so let's look at one more example here. We're going to use the figure at the right to find the probability that a randomly selected draft pick is not a running back or a wide receiver. So they're not a running back and they're not a wide, um, wide receiver. So we're looking at, this is kind of a little chart of the breakdown of position by 253 players picked in the 2016 NFL draft. So you can actually see it a little bit more clearly on in your homework. Um, and we're focusing here on running back and wide receiver. So I'm just actually going to circle this. So the running back data is right here. 
and my wide receiver data is right here. Okay, so just kind of zooming in on um, those two pieces. And I also see that I have a total, it's a little hard to read, uh, but it says 253 for the players that they're looking at um, in this chart. So I have a total, without having to add them all up by myself, of 253 players here. Okay, now I have part of the solution started, so we're going to define our events. So let A be the draft pick is a running back and B be the draft pick is a wide receiver. Now these events are mutually exclusive. So someone who is playing running back is not also playing wide receiver at the same time. Um, so you should have mutually exclusive events here. Um, so let's do the following. So I kind of cut this off here and we'll do it together ourselves. So what I actually want to find first here is the probability of getting event A or event B. Okay, so I do see that keyword of or there. So I'm gonna start with using the idea of, well, what's the chance of actually getting a running back or wide receiver? So I know the question is about not getting a running back or wide receiver, but what's the chance that we actually do get a running back or wide receiver? So let's find that first. So I'm looking at the probability of A, plus the probability of B. And again, I said they're mutually exclusive, so we don't have to worry about any overlap here. Well, I have 23 um, running backs out of the 253 in the chart, and I have 31 wide receivers out of the 253 in the chart. So altogether, I'm looking at 54 out of 253 people um, for being either a running back or a wide receiver. Okay, so this is the probability that we pick a running back or wide receiver. So there's 54 people there. Now, I actually don't want that. I want the probability that we do not pick a running back or wide receiver. So I'm looking at everybody else left over actually. So I'm gonna use the idea of complement here. So I'm gonna take one, sorry, one minus that probability. Now, one whole would be 253 over 253 here. And I get 199 over 250. Three. So there are 199 other players who are not in these positions. Now, I use the complement here to help me with that subtraction, but you didn't have to. So if you actually went through, what you could have also done is added up all the other players in different positions. I'm just kind of circling them right now. Right. So I could add up the players in those different positions instead, and I would get the 199. So I could either use the complement here, find the chance of getting one of those two players and subtract, or I could go back to the kind of the beginning and actually add up those who are not those players from the start and find that probability instead. And you get the same answer either way. We get about 0.77. So just two different ways to think about the same problem. Again, one way is the complement, which worked here because then I only had to add up two numbers. So it was a little bit easier. And then I could subtract with one to kind of get everybody else left over, um, which is really what I was looking for. But the other way to think about it, which is perfectly acceptable, is to say, OK, I don't want these two. I want everybody else. So we add up everybody else and put that over the total. And in either case, you're still going to get that 199 out of 253 or about 0.787 for your probability.